It is uh, a great pleasure uh, to be with you here today in person. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ed Nikeza. I oversee the data science and clinical research efforts at Gluco. I also have a daughter that lives with type 1 diabetes and just want to say I'm very encouraged by all the progress the community is making in using technology and ML to improve the lives of those living with chronic conditions. Uh, it is an honor to moderate this session and to be joined by Professor Charles Tivoulet from the Center of Diabetes, uh, Diabicare in France, and Gluco's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Mark Clements. Today our experts will be talking about the current state and future development of telemedicine in treating people with chronic conditions. First, Professor Trivillet will share his experience of using remote patient monitoring as a tool to improve care for people with diabetes in France. We'll have a 10-minute Q&A session after his talk, so please hold your questions to the end. Then, uh, keeping with the theme of improving the lives of those living with chronic conditions, Dr. Clements will talk about the use of machine learning and digital therapeutics to help with behavior modification. I'm hopeful that you can or will see how these two topics and techniques are interrelated and can be used in concert to improve the lives of those living with chronic conditions. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to introduce you to Gluco. We are a global company with over 32 billion data points in our ecosystem. We have served approximately 3.5 million patients across 8,500 clinics in over 30 countries and currently support 22 languages. One of the things I love about Gluco and that my daughter loves about Gluco is that we are device agnostic. If you have a preference in the type of glucose meter, insulin pump, fitness tracker, etc., you'll likely, will likely be able to support those as we support over 95% of all diabetes and fitness devices on the market. We serve those living with diabetes and their families and caretakers and provide our mobile and web applications to them for free. And we also serve providers and clinics and have a wide range of tools, reports, and insights that we deliver through our web application. We sit between both the patient and the provider in our design solutions and insights. Uh, we offer them for, for both co cohorts. Another differentiator is that we have a randomized clinical trial. Uh, here you can see that folks enrolled in one of our remote patient monitoring programs, you can see the red dots uh, listed as RPM, have a st statistically significant drop in their A1C after three and six months of being on our program. One of our North Stars here at Gluco is passive data collection. We aim to reduce the burden associated with chronic conditions, and as a result, we make collecting data easy. Device data can be uploaded in clinic via one of our transmitters, or it can be uploaded through our mobile app, and in many cases can be synced automatically through Bluetooth connection. If you have any questions about Gluco, please do not hesitate to reach out or stop by our booth this week. Uh, I know in my household, one of the silver linings of COVID is that remote care and telemedicine became a reality. Instead of driving two hours to see our endocrinologist, uh, we were able to connect remotely. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Professor uh, Charles Tivoulet, uh, so we can hear about his experience with remote monitoring in France. Professor Tivillet is a professor of medicine in endocrinology and diabetes at the University Hospital of Lyon, France, and medical director of the Center for Diabetes Diab e Care of the Hospices Civelles de Lyon, a center dedicated to youths and adults with type 1 diabetes. Professor Tivillet received his medical degree and PhD in immunology at the University Claude Bernard in Lyon, where he completed training in endocrinology and diabetes. His clinical areas of interest include automated insulin infusion systems and prevention of type 1 diabetes, 
with immune intervention protocols. As the past president of the French-speaking Diabetes Society, he has been involved in the organization of diabetes care and reimbursement of telehealth monitoring. Professor Tule is also well published with more than 200 peer-reviewed uh, publications in international journals. Professor, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I would like also to thank you, Gluco, to give me the opportunity to uh, expose the French experience on telehealth uh, monitoring. So here are my disclosures. Well, uh, I have, uh, as you can see, uh, some uh, uh, past in the, in the clinical activities, and so we have uh, as many in this room, I guess, the experience uh, of uh, the continuous change in diabetes care. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, don't, uh, I haven't met the, the guy on the left, but I took some picture of uh, uh, a diabetes uh, logbook with uh, the weather indicated on the right side. I don't know if it's the weather forecast or the moon with diabetes for this patient. It was very interesting to, to have this uh, 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 as a picture. Then in the middle, uh, we spend some time as a clinician to guess what are the missing values in the logbook by comparing the mean blood glucose from capillary samples with the mean blood glucose extrapolated from the HB1C value. And now uh, we have this uh, very promising feature of uh, uh, dealing with uh, plenty of data uh, first, uh, the continuous glucose data, uh, then the insulin infusion uh, regimen with the balises, the amount of carbohydrates, the uh, also levels of activity at the bottom, and we have now these uh, new indicators, timing range, uh, variation coefficient, and so on, in our daily uh, practice. So. Uh, this is very uh, promising, but uh, does the technology be enough to transform the daily life of people with diabetes? That's the main challenge, in fact. So for that, uh, we uh, can uh, address this question with this first uh, 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 study performed in uh, 2018 from 17 different countries with subject with type 1 diabetes above the age of 26, and this is the SAGE uh, study. Here you see that you have uh, some differences between uh, countries according to the excess of uh, uh, continuous glucose monitoring issues. And this was, uh, in fact, at that period, mainly flash uh, glucose monitoring. You see, for example, that uh, uh, there was a difference in France due to reimbursement con condition that the, the AZ access uh, to this uh, technology. Uh, this is also uh, the case for blood uh, ketone meter uh, technology. Uh, you can see at the bottom that the, the study age uh, was uh, 47 uh, and the mean duration of diabetes was uh, 20 years. Uh, one important point is that only 20% of the subjects were treated by pump. Uh, what was the the what were the results from this study in terms of HB1C levels. You see here that concerning the individualized HB1C target, and if not uh, defined, a target below 7%, you see that only 20% of the subject as a mean overall uh, reached this target. And there was no so much difference in France despite the easy access to technology. So this is the main uh, results uh, from this study indicating the, that there is some need to improve our uh, results. Uh, how to explain this mismatch between the access to technology and the disappointing per performance? First, you can imagine that there are some inappropriate adjustments of insulin regimens in face of unpredictable situations. That's the daily life of people with diabetes. The lack of educational practices. You, you can know, but you have to do. Uh, so from knowledge to doing, there are still some needs to improve this. And 
uh, as also it's very uh, easy to, to understand that due to the complexity of the disease with a heavy psychological burden, there is some difficulty to maintain long-term goals. So faced to these different points, uh, maybe uh, new care pathways are, are to be uh, considered with telemonitoring and multi-professional approaches. So that's uh, the main conclusion from this uh, uh, situation. Well, this opened the new era of digital diabetes care. So we have the chance, we can say, to have this uh, terrible COVID-19 crisis that uh, illustrated the need to improve uh, the contact with the patients and uh, the, the telemedicine in this situation was really uh, uh, very useful. It demonstrated also the limited numbers of healthcare professionals uh, for outpatient care. And this is really true in France where all the, 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 the healthcare and the, the, uh, the, the, the team, the size of the team is more uh, uh, adapted to uh, hospitalized uh, patients and not from outpatients. It's also underlined the need to, of platforms with dedicated personals, including MDs, nurses, geticians, working together uh, 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 around the patients. And also, it's also indicated the necessity to get both the insulin and glucose data to uh, assess the situation and to provide optimal digital diabetes care. So you have to have this combine, combined vision of the, of the data. So what does it, it imply? Uh, first, the access of electronic recalls interoperability and security of the data. Uh, second, the wearable devices that transmit the data for analysis and help for remote monitoring. If you don't have the data, you cannot provide uh, advices. There is also some need to have decision support tools for ACPs and also secure space for chat between ACPs and patients. And also to have the capacity to provide teleconsultation when it's needed. So uh, the first step of uh, the moving toward digital diabetes care is to have uh, a policy at the government level into, to provide into action. Policy is a crucial step uh, to achieve action. And this is the true to have first this broad digital health infrastructure and electronic health records and telemonitoring capacity. If you don't have the, 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 the support for that, it's very difficult. Then uh, it's important to, to make the coverage of digital diabetes in diabetes policy and to have uh, a, a real encouragement uh, on, on this level and to have specific incentives and payments issues. So we have the, in this uh, 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 concept, we have this uh, experimental program that was launched in uh, 2018 uh, for four years that's, it's called ETAP, Experimentation of Telemedicine to Ameliorate the Healthcare Pathways in France. That was pro, uh, programmed for five chronic disease, for telehealth monitoring, and you have cardiac uh, heart failure, kidney failure, respiratory difficulties, arrhythmia, and diabetes. With the definition of the target population, the technical requirement, pricing packages, monitoring, education, and evaluation after six months. The main objective of this program was to reduce the number of recurrent hospitalization. And this is not uh, really adapted for diabetes, but uh, that was the, the situation. Uh, the disease control, the improvement of diabetes, uh, of the patient quality of life, improvement in care and efficiency. There was some financial support, but it can be outlined at this stage that the support concerned uh, mainly the electronic system. That was the, the situation uh, in June 20. Uh, you had a, a main increase in the recruitment uh, uh, from uh, uh, in one year due to a uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis. But it's important for diabetes to understand that the initial inclusion criteria were people for, with diabetes above 19 years of age with HB1C above 8% 
or for adolescents uh, above 8.5 percent, or within six months after the introduction of insulin. And for people with type 2 diabetes, the HP1C was above uh, 9 percent to enter the, the program. Uh, the inclusion for to health monitoring for people with diabetes was slow at the initiation of the program due to the limitation of the financial support. That was the numbers, uh, and you see that you have three times more for the technical system in contrast to the healthcare professional for six months per patient. There were some complex administrative issues, and these programs were mainly hospital-based. And it did not include at the beginning uh, the glucose uh, monitoring system, but only capillary blood glucose. So um, the inclusion increased during and after COVID conf confinement. Rapidly, the, the, the program was, was extended due to the crisis with main objectives to the need to maintain the excess of care, the protection of healthcare professionals and patients, with new education, uh, according to Professional and Patient Association, ruling out uh, the need to have uh, HB1C values and included also the, uh, uh, the continuous glucose uh, uh, value. The first steps uh, were uh, for all the patients, but mainly for high-risk subjects, and there was some uh, uh, good input in the reimbursement of all teleconsultation, and we uh, uh, moved from 10,000 to 1 million per week teleconsultation, reimbursed for all healthcare professionals. There was also the reimbursement of nurse and dietitian care afterwards. So this is also a very important issue of that. Then we have to train uh, the HDPs to raise uh, awareness to alarms and confidence in uh, dealing uh, uh, with the patient at distance with the, the digital diabetes tools. And uh, we know that the landscape has been considerably moving uh, forward in the last years, going back from the capillary blood glucose and glucose meters to standalone or connected CGM, insulin pumps, closed loop insulin delivery systems, smart insulin pens, and also to deal with uh, smartphone apps and the difficulty to make the connection with diabetes-specific medical devices. So clearly, you need to improve the knowledge of all the HCPs, and this is very difficult to maintain this for all the team. There are some multiple challenges. Uh, the access to data connectivity through the mobile phone versus computers, the interaction with the person with diabetes that implies uh, really adequate qualification in order to have a, a, a care uh, 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 qualification. Uh, the staff availability is a clearly an important point to ensure the follow-up of uh, all the alerts with new responsibilities, especially for nurses. Uh, the need for development of new healthcare pathways despite limited resources. So. One main issue from this challenge for ACPs is the promotion of new professional interactions with the delegation uh, of usual tasks. So you, you understand now that there are some, a lot of difficulties to launch a telehealth monitoring system. Well, technology drives new healthcare organization, that's for sure. Uh, our healthcare system are challenged, and this is the case in France where legacy payment system favor volume over value. It's a fragmented and disconnected care delivery method. Uh, in Clare, you have uh, initiation of a, a system with one uh, uh, professional and the follow-up will be with maybe another professional. This is a problem uh, and a, a source of disruption of care. It's not adapted for chronic disease such, such a, as diabetes. And telemonitoring offers ways to change this by filling the gap between the medical visit, by initiating the individual's model of care, and to promote this multidisciplinary care delivery model. So this is the example we had in mind by opening this uh, Center for Diabetes Jab eCare in France. Uh, it's an integrated practice unit for people with type 1 diabetes above the age of 10. It's really connected with the university hospital. It's funded by the pr public funding, 
uh, and all the team belong to the hospital. We are uh, connected with uh, the other departments for General Hospital and uh, Liberal Medicine, but we have also uh, an electronic health record from the hospital connected with the uh, uh, biology system and also allowing uh, telemedicine uh, for retina exam, for example. And so we are performing some telemonitoring digital care, uh, the face-to-face -face consultation, the routine checkup, the care program, emergency, and also clinical research. It is important to say that it's the same team that uh, is uh, involved in all these issues. Uh, well, uh, some, uh, this slide is, uh, there is a, a very nice music besides this. Very, <laughs> it's like a, a, a nice story I'm telling. Uh, so um, here is the, uh, a publication we made uh, on the first uh, adults with uh, poorly controlled type 1 diabetes uh, with the criteria, the initial criteria from the ETAP program with HB1C above 8%. It was 8.7%. And uh, so we can show that there was some improvement without changing uh, the type of device uh, with a decrease in HB1C levels uh, by 0.66%. Uh, um, this is uh, more striking to uh, uh, show the, the story of Nadine uh, at the bottom, a 63-year-old woman uh, with type 1 diabetes treated with PAMP and uh, flash glucose monitoring with an HB1C of 8.5%. She was really uh, in, uh, in a difficult situation uh, with uh, his treat uh, her treatment. She wanted to stop uh, the pump. And so she started telemonitoring with Dibicare. And so with the help of Emily at the, the bottom, we show the, can sh see the, the improvement of uh, diabetes control. And she was more confident and she was more uh, keen to prolong the, the treatment. For sure, it's a single story like that, but it's very striking to have some good example to say that it's uh, very needed uh, for to, to, to launch this system. Here, we, we can also understand that telemonitoring is part of the initiation of a hybrid closed loop system in outpatient settings. We put all the pumps in outpatient settings, and this is really the, the, a chance to monitor the, the switch from a uh, the basal IQ to control IQ. Uh, this was the, the theme uh, of the president talk in this room uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, it's uh, the capacity to adjust the pump parameters, the insulin settings, the uh, insulin carbohydrate ratios, check for missing or late boluses, and notification of transmission failures. And this is really uh, very interesting. Uh, Tele, uh, digital care also promote new activities. Here is the, the case of the dietetician with uh, uh, the capacity to maintain some face-to-face -face consultation, but also to uh, launch some uh, remote uh, uh, care program with the functional insulin therapy, you can see. But also by doing the telemonitoring to have uh, photographs of the meals and to understand and to help uh, the patient to understand why the blood glucose increase after the meal due to the cordon bleu et gratin dauphinois, very rich in fat, uh, very, very nice, but very uh, uh, rich in fat. And so you understand the, the uh, significance of the, of the fat on the blood glucose. We have also the capacity to make some physical activity, and we have a physical activity teacher. You have also the remote uh, care program, but also the, the chance to uh, explain uh, after an exercise why the blood glucose may be influenced. And you see here uh, three different uh, closed loop systems we are uh, performing in, uh, in our center, and the difficulty to understand uh, the effect with three different systems and three different platforms. And so you uh, must have the knowledge of what is uh, what's the meaning of all these uh, curves by uh, switching from one platform to another. Uh, our center also means transforming the payment models. Uh, there are some uh, uh, several outcomes. Uh, the first to account for the increased number of patients. 
the, easy, the need to uh, have an easy access to innovations, also to respons responsibilize uh, healthcare professional on the question of quality uh, and health values and not volume values. And so this is a difficulty to, uh, uh, in the daily life with the administration. To increase the use of telemedicine, to favor the reactivity, to answer very rapidly to uh, messages within 24 hours, to promote the clinical research. So we have uh, launched a series of bad impairment for care cycles with uh, uh, the old tarification of, uh, of uh, the acts, but also uh, some kind of derogation of practice with uh, the social security that financed the, 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 the outpatient uh, initiation of insulin pumps. We have this uh, program uh, ETAP with the telemonitoring for six months, uh, therapeutic uh, education uh, with care programs and convention for clinical research. And all these make uh, things possible at the end. So then we have the need to have uh, guidance and diabetes plan to uh, uh, have clinical guidelines and recommendation about digital tools. And we have two uh, main uh, uh, program. Uh, first, uh, we uh, launch uh, uh, a recommendation uh, called Telesurveillance et Diabète uh, with uh, an interesting graph at the bottom, uh, a proposal, uh, and we hope this uh, proposal will be uh, taken by the authorities. First, uh, um, uh, a payment at the initiation of the, of the uh, cycle, tele, uh, telehealth monitoring cycle, but also uh, uh, some uh, basic uh, uh, funding, then two levels. It's, so I think uh, the <laughs> music is increasing because it's very important. Payment is important. So you have uh, level one or level two according to the complexity of, uh, of uh, the care. Uh, for example, uh, putting a, a, a initiating a, a closed loop system will be level two, uh, as well as the pregnancy. Uh, with uh, type 1 diabetes, and then uh, cycle for three months, and then evaluation after three months. We have also the Haute Autorité Santé, who uh, um, launch uh, 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 don't, uh, the, this uh, program, and uh, she, uh, these uh, authorities uh, had uh, launched a um, uh, uh, publication uh, indicating what uh, are the necessary needs for, for that. Uh, an important uh, point is that uh, they indicated that uh, both glucose and insulin was necessary uh, for the follow-up and to get reimbursement you need to have both indicators uh, for that. Now uh, going back to the, going now to the reimbursement pathways, it needs to have the facilitator for improvement the healthcare system, and this is crucial to have the, the finance. And so we have, uh, as always in France, uh, something uh, both simple and complex, uh, a digital framework with the first the clinical guidelines in this uh, uh, authority, CNEDIMS uh, HIS, then the Ministry of Health, DGOS, uh, for uh, elaborating the programs and evaluating the programs, then a new agency, the Digital Health Agency, has been created last year uh, for the digital transformation of healthcare, for security, interoperability, to launch digital health tools. And then, and the last, the Social Security Agency in connection with the Ministry of Economy uh, to develop uh, the package and the bundle payments, and this is really <laughs> The, the main uh, point of the, of the talk is that we don't have really the a good uh, view of this, uh, but I hope it will be in the next few months. So in summary, uh, I will say that telemedicine is now clearly integrated in the French landscape and experimentation like ETAP will be transformed in 2022 into ordinary care solutions but the financial support for HCPs is still a matter of discussion and debate. The COVID-19 crisis has clearly illustrated the importance to reorganize our healthcare system and care pathways, and it's uh, uh, very interesting to see what will be uh, the reorganization in the next years. There is an urgent need to standardize tools uh, with interoperative platform for glucose data, pens, pumps, 
and additional data for improved outcomes. And I will say that uh, I addressed uh, this uh, evening uh, a message to all companies involved in diabetes care that should integrate this open world to facilitate data management. I thank you for uh, your attention with uh, this image of uh, the old hospital in Lyon. Thank you. Uh, we'd now like to open up the floor for any questions. Uh, the format here is just please walk up to uh, one of the microphones and, and ask a question. So we have about uh, 10 minutes, so uh, feel free to um, jump up there. I guess uh, while we're waiting for um, those questions to roll in, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start you off. Um, in your talk, I, I think it's clear that you're an advocate for uh, remote monitoring. Um, do you think it's possible for a third party to do the remote monitoring, or do you think there's still a role for the endocrinologist or uh, diabetologist um, in, in that paradigm? Thank you. This is a, a very important question, I would say, uh, for, for the future of myself, but also in the young endocrinologist. Uh, in fact, it's very important to understand that uh, telemonitoring is just an add-on of the clinical care, and it's not a substitution. So you need to have a continuum between uh, the initiation of the, of the uh, care program and, uh, and also to have the, uh, the still the medical responsibility of what is going on. So I would say that uh, it's very dangerous to delegate uh, this activity to uh, a third party without knowing uh, the uh, clinical uh, 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 conditions and also to not to have this uh, interview uh, at the beginning to uh, uh, wait for what are the position of the patient, uh, the, 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 the secret will uh, to, to understand what's, uh, what will be the best solution for him. Thank you. Yeah, I see we have a question in the back. Um, go ahead. Frida Sundberg, pediatric diabetologist, Gothenburg, Sweden. I'm very curious how to learn how you have managed our common EU uh, regulations regarding GDPR when developing such a new system. Well, uh, I don't understand perfectly your question with it. Is it, is it uh, a warning or difficulties to go on on that or? Uh... Uh, I think both our countries are members of the EU and uh, according to our authorities, the GDPR regulations regarding personal data and especially regarding transatlantic uh, transferring of data is an obvious obstacle to all these important solutions. So I'm very curious to learn how your authorities uh, have uh, accepted your project and how you have solved that conflict. Well, concerning the telemonitoring solution, I, uh, I thank you for your question. Uh, we, we belong to the same uh, community, European community, I, and this is a very nice community. Uh, going back to the, the question, uh, we uh, started the project with uh, uh, the Gluco XT, but uh, all uh, it was uh, Diab Next. Uh, in the it was uh, uh, all the data was uh, uh, secured in France, and so there is no uh, no problem on that. And for the program ETAP, uh, the Ministry uh, of Health was very. Uh, uh, regarding this, uh, this issue, and all the protection of the data has been performed on this, uh, on this uh, uh, situation. So you keep the data in France? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I guess I'll just chime in since this is a, a Gluco uh, session. Uh, so Gluco, uh, any data that is in the EU does also stay in, in the EU. Uh, so we have those same policies. Uh, please. Um, David Kerr, Santa Barbara, California. I'm wondering how much progress you have made in integrating wearable technology, including CGM, into the EHR. EHR? Electronic Health Record. Okay. <laughs> well, um, 
It's, it's difficult because you need, uh, you, you are, as a clinician, you just uh, uh, need to have all the system working together. Uh, then uh, you are speaking to uh, um, uh, specialists from the industry and uh, also some uh, uh, a person that uh, uh, takes time to uh, integrate all this uh, together. So we have two system uh, parallel. Uh, the system that uh, the platform with uh, that integrate all the system and then the electronic record so we need to have at, at present to several screen together uh, the the uh, what, what the, the future will be to combine everything in one single uh, I, I was system. actually hoping you'd already achieved yeah no that, no 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 okay no. thank you I'm like you <laughs> Uh, hello, I have a question, uh, Mark Clements uh, from uh, Kansas City, uh, USA. Uh, so uh, your ATOP system in France is very similar to efforts, I think, that are happening elsewhere in the world, including in the United States. Uh, we call it remote patient monitoring. Uh, and uh, individuals with diabetes uh, and other chronic conditions can share uh, data uh, from uh, devices on a monthly basis. And then uh, health systems can be reimbursed uh, for providing uh, virtual care, as you have described. So very similar in, in some respects. But in the United States, one of the big problems that we face is that many health systems uh, see this as an overwhelming shift in the paradigm of care and have a really difficult time launching a remote patient monitor. Uh, similar to the ATOPS program. And, and so uh, I wonder, um, you know, from your experience, what advice you might give to those in other national markets uh, on how to get started when it's such an overwhelming task? Well, uh, for sure, uh, with diabetes, you have to, re uh, to, to uh, make the difference between uh, the numbers, like type 2 patients, for example, with the uh, huge numbers and type 1 patient with uh, a lot of uh, data to, uh, to interpret. Because uh, the, the economist will say uh, from the, the, the healthcare system, well, you are speaking about huge number of patients, so this will be very costly. So it's very important to define the population at the beginning, uh, because from this definition will come the, 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 the payments. Uh, if uh, you have... Uh, too much patient, the, the, the amount of money for healthcare professional would be very, very uh, little. So it's very important at the beginning to uh, discuss some numbers. All right. Um, I will encourage everyone, if you have additional questions uh, per, for Professor Tuvalet, um please uh, stick around afterwards and, and uh, you know, please ask him. Um, I would uh, now like to uh, take this time uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, my Gluco colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Clements. Uh, Dr. Clements is the Chief Medical Officer at Gluco and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. And I, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. Can we get another round of applause for Professor Trinale? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, now back to the intro. So uh, Dr. Clements uh, began his training as a medical scientist um, where he received his medical degree and PhD in de developmental uh, neuroscience from the Washington University Medi Medical School in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, his research interests include studying big data in type 1 diabetes, including electronic health records data, national and international registry data, understanding the relationship between glucose variability and diabetes-related complications, the identification of novel predictors of risk for diabetes-related uh, complications, prevention of type 1 diabetes, the use of advanced machine learning and natural language processing to improve uh, type 1 diabetes care, the development of mHealth digital health interventions to improve type 1 diabetes care, and health system interventions to promote 
data mobility, and type 1 diabetes. Uh, Mark does about everything. <laughs> and with that, uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Ed. And, and I'd like to thank again uh, Professor Tivole for uh, uh, sharing your experience. It's very enlightening to me. Um, I also must say uh, that that was lovely music playing behind you. Uh, and I don't know about Prof uh, Professor Tivole, but I neither sing nor dance, which we often expect when there's music. Uh, but um, perhaps if the music rises again, we can stop and I can recite some Baudelaire in your honor or uh, some Lorca uh, uh, to celebrate this place. So uh, um, we'll uh, continue on here. So uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, uh, this next presentation is not uh, a presentation of scientific evidence. It's not uh, a presentation of um, uh, many studies. It's a presentation that is really a little bit of a thought experiment I'd ask you to um, uh, walk with me on. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about how um, other industries have utilized um, uh, data and uh, machine learning and uh, business insights to improve uh, business operations. And I think in clinical care, we are uh, uh, just on the cusp of being able to unlock these uh, capabilities. Uh, and I think also we have a unique opportunity here because uh, one can aim that sort of uh, business intelligence um, solution, not just at the business, but also at the customer, uh, the individual with a chronic disease. So a couple of disclosures. I am, of course, Chief Medical Officer at Gluco, and I have received research support from Dexcom and Abbott Diabetes Care. I also uh, have some uh, grant funding from the National Institutes of Health, from um, uh, the Helmsley Charitable Trust, and uh, uh, am on some projects from the JDRF. Uh, two disclaimers. I do not consider myself an expert in AI or machine learning or in the field of just-in-time adaptive interventions. I'm merely a student of both. Uh, and also, I want to emphasize that Gluco does not offer the predictive analytic and JITI solutions that I will discuss today on its platform yet. Uh, this presentation is designed to be educational. So uh, we'll start with our objectives. Uh, first, uh, I'd ask us to consider today how machine learning uh, and uh, if we use a simpler term, predicting or forecasting, uh, can help us to identify at-risk individuals within the population, uh, because I, I do think that sometimes diabetes centers are overwhelmed by how to get started with population health management. So identifying you know, that slice of the population that is at the highest risk for the outcome you're trying to improve may be very important. Uh, also, uh, we can ask ourselves how machine learning can help identify optimal moments uh, for intervention and the optimal approaches to nudging behaviors that drive outcomes. And this is very important because uh, those of us who've been practicing for a while recognize very quickly in our careers that treating a chronic disease, especially diabetes, is 10% physiology and 90% behavior. Behavior for the person with diabetes and also behavior for all of us operating in the clinics and the hospitals. Uh, and then finally, uh, we can consider how digital therapeutics can be used to nudge individuals toward health-promoting behaviors. So uh, first, let me define the scope of the problem. Uh, you, you know, just to remind us, uh, we, we all know of uh, many data indicating that we are not achieving optimal outcomes in both type 2 and type 1 diabetes care. Uh, but as a reminder of that, I will show you uh, this graphic. Uh, these data come from the UK PDS, um, showing that uh, in individuals with recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes, there is a rise in hemoglobin A1C after diagnosis, uh, and it occurs uh, after the initiation of both conventional and intensive treatment. And also, uh, if one looks at data from the US T1D exchange, uh, these data are replicated in some European registries, uh, uh, approximately, uh, but we can see that uh, individuals with type 1 diabetes across the lifespan are not meeting the hemoglobin A1C target, which in the U.S. is currently less than 7 percent. Not only are individuals not meeting the glycemic target across the lifespan, 
but also children are doing particularly badly. Uh, individuals who are diagnosed uh, at or before the age of eight experience a rise in their hemoglobin A1C. Uh, large numbers of them do. Uh, and so you can see this sort of mountain on the left. I call that Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, this is the mountain we're trying to climb in pediatric care. And it takes until age 30 for these young people to come back down off the mountain. And it is during this period of time, childhood to age 30, that they are accumulating uh, the bulk of their lifetime risk for diabetes-related complications. So uh, it is true, it's not every individual who's having this rise, but it is a significant number of them who are. So how do we identify at-risk individuals in a population? Well, uh, the first thing we should recognize is that uh, we have the tools available to us to identify at-risk individuals. The problem is that uh, uh, these tools are, in fact, the data. And we're surrounded by such abundant data uh, that we almost get lost in the ocean of data. And we don't know exactly how to leverage them as a tool, as a simple tool, uh, to help us uh, advance the care of the clinical population. So it has been said that we have uh, oceans of data, uh, but uh, only rivers of information. Uh, these translate to small puddles of knowledge and occasionally the odd drop of wisdom. And I feel this is true in particular in diabetes care because uh, if I think about the uh, variables and the data that we collect on a weekly basis and that we document in our medical records, probably our decision-making heuristics are based on less than 5% of all of the available information. And so then one is left to ask, why are we documenting the rest of it? To what purpose? What is the potential utility, if anything, for all this other information we surround ourselves with? So a question that I have asked in my own career, uh, taking off my gluco hat and putting on my academic hat for one second, is what if uh, we could take the electronic medical record data and patient reported outcomes data that we might be collecting in various ways uh, in centers across the world and combine those with diabetes self-management device data in a way that would allow us not to mm, search across the population for people who've already had a negative outcome, but uh, calculate the forecasted risk of that individual for a negative outcome. And so uh, one of the mental models we have used is that uh, for a given clinic population on the left, uh, that population will presumably have a diverse risk uh, for any outcome we're interested in improving. That risk might be uh, deteriorating glycemic control in the form of hemoglobin A1C or time and range. It might be um, increased risk for recurrent hospitalization, which we see in the U.S. in a lot of adolescents. Uh, but that population will also presumably have a diverse responsiveness to any given therapy that you put in front of them. And so we all know that we uh, introduce to some persons with diabetes a continuous glucose monitor, and the evidence says that many people will have an improvement in their glycemic control with that, but not everybody has this improvement. We introduce an insulin pump, and the same. Not everybody has the improvement, or a hybrid closed-loop system, and not everybody has the improvement. So the same can be said for any behavioral or care delivery intervention that we might introduce to try to nudge the individual toward health-promoting behaviors to be more successful on the insulin or oral medication or device that they're using. Um, so uh, if we can use all of the available biomarkers, as I said in the previous slide, from uh, the devices and the medical record and uh, patient-reported outcomes data, then we might be able to stratify um, in the middle column here in a way that allows us to try some stuff, um, uh, such as uh, uh, more intensive remote patient monitoring with weekly or biweekly contacts, uh, perhaps introducing some social program like a peer mentoring program that is being tested in several 
centers in the U.S., both for uh, youth and adults, um, or a variety of digital therapeutics. And the, the pace of the introduction of digital therapeutics, uh, I think, is dizzying uh, these days. So it's difficult as a diabetologist even to imagine how to get one's arms around all of these new tools that might impact the behavior of the person with diabetes in their daily living um, and, and to understand whether these are helping our patients. Um, as you can see on the right, I categorize uh, these interventions that I've uh, sort of listed in red into uh, two different categories in the inner bubble. Uh, you know, the primary therapies are drugs, biologics, and devices. Uh, but uh, uh, the therapies that address the 90% uh, of the problem I mentioned earlier, which is behavior, well, these are uh, behavioral interventions. Uh, they might include things like cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational interviewing. M health interventions, I think of M health or digital health simply as a vehicle uh, for behavioral interventions. And then care delivery interventions. So uh, that is uh, reflecting an intervention on the structure of the health system and on the health care providers, the dietitians, the nurses, the clinicians uh, who are delivering care to see whether we can change our behavior to create a structure that allows the individual to be more successful. So I'll show you just one uh, little bit of data, um, uh, you know, just to uh, uh, provide an example. So um, in our clinic, uh, we developed a model to predict uh, rise in hemoglobin A1C in the next 90 days. Uh, we developed this model uh, using data from uh, youth 9 to 18 years old. You remember Mount Kilimanjaro. So we selected essentially that population uh, because they were the ones experiencing uh, uh, the biggest rise. Um, we selected individuals who were diagnosed for at least six months uh, with type 1 diabetes. Uh, we developed our um, initial model uh, using uh, over 1,700 individuals. Uh, and nearly 10,000 uh, clinic visit intervals, so approximately 90-day visit intervals. Um, after uh, testing several different methods, we settled on a random forest model, so multiple decision trees, uh, which is a, a particularly interesting approach to take when you are trying to use electronic health record data and you have a wide data set that... Uh, uh, may include a number of uh, features derived from um, uh, natural language processing of free text clinical notes, in addition to the discrete data like laboratory values, height, weight, et cetera, that might be recorded in the medical record. Um, and uh, uh, three, over 300 features were evaluated uh, um, after threefold um, uh, validation of this. Uh, the model um, when we initially uh, performed the uh, debugging or, or the threefold validation, um, had a uh, positive predictive value or precision of uh, between 55 and 60 percent. And that was against a backdrop of approximately 25 uh, to 30 percent of our patients experiencing a rise in A1C in the next 90 days. So we essentially uh, created a twofold risk enrichment. Um, and uh, if one extends that thought experiment, you could say that if we were to pick a patient out of uh, this population uh, who is predicted to have a rise in A1C in the next 90 days, that we have a one in uh, two chance, uh, better than a one in two chance of intervening on a patient who actually is going to have deterioration. And so maybe occasionally we're intervening on somebody who didn't need it, uh, but this is the way I think about these interventions. We, of course, would like to get the precision um, to a higher level, to 75%, 80%, or even higher. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of learning to do in the field before we can do that. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing that uh, I will uh, comment on uh, related to this model is that uh, some of you might uh, acknowledge that hemoglobin A1C is falling a little bit out of favor, uh, particularly in type 1 diabetes care, and uh, is there something that... Uh, uh, we can do elsewhere, and uh, if we have time, we can, we can talk about that at the end. So once you have a risk-based population, um, one might ask, okay, but what do we do about it? And this uh, calls back to the question that I asked uh, do, uh, Dr. Professor Tivole, uh, which is, uh, you know, today all of our care 
is smashed into these four clinic visits a year in the United States. Uh, this constitutes, uh, uh, as uh, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, elsewhere have uh, commented previously, approximately 0.03% of one's waking hours with diabetes, right? It's a very tiny slice of time in, uh, in which we have an opportunity to influence them. So, you know, years ago, uh, before I was involved in GLUCO, in fact, you know, I, I uh, thought, well, why can't we uh, simply allow the individual with diabetes to share data via a device or a home computer um, to the cloud and then have the diabetes center actively pull those data down and become co-innovators in this space uh, and then create alerts and data visualizations based on these data that recombine device data with medical record data in useful ways or that apply machine learning or other algorithms to forecast outcomes. And then why can't we use um, what I call video micro visits, uh, so short form telehealth consultations uh, that can be conducted by a clinician or a member of the diabetes education team, um, or even text messages, which is very difficult to do in the U.S. outside of a research study, um, so that we can engage with the individual in a way that is both palatable to them and effective. Um, so, you know, I've started to think a lot about how do we achieve a smart and scalable system? And I think the formula looks something like this, that a diabetes center needs to implement population health dashboards, that perhaps at some point those population health dashboards include not just um, the output of Boolean search uh, terms where we look and find all the individuals who already have an elevated A1C or already have elevated lipid levels uh, based on historical data, but we're actually forecasting uh, outcomes that will happen so that we can get in front of the problem, that we then uh, combine that capability with a backbone of remote engagement, getting out of the in-clinic brick-and-mortar consultation, and then we extend the clinical team uh, by leveraging digital therapeutics and uh, what we'll define in just a moment uh, as just-in-time adaptive interventions that might even be run using those digital therapeutics. And, uh, you know, really in the uh, 1960s and 70s, Toyota gave the world the great gift because they developed quality improvement systems, and in the last two decades, healthcare has really adopted uh, Lean and Six Sigma and the model for uh, improvement. And so we really have the opportunity to um, uh, use the tools of quality improvement, including the Deming Wheel, plan, do, study, act cycles, to try to start with small tests of change. Uh, again, hearkening back to my que question for Professor Tivole, how do you get started? Well, perhaps you don't start with the entire clinic all at once. Perhaps you start uh, with my clinic next Tuesday with eight patients, and then we slowly expand over time. So we're on a roadmap right now to try to implement remote patient monitoring uh, over a three-year cycle across our entire population, and, and we think that will work. So let me shift gears for just a moment and um, now talk about uh, that last component, which is what can machine learning or AI um, teach us about identifying optimal moments and approaches to nudging behavior? And again, this will be a little thought experiment. So there aren't many examples of this in the diabetes world, but there are examples of it, if you look in the psychology literature, uh, in chronic disease, um, in particular in the fields of weight loss uh, and uh, um, uh, motivating individuals for physical activity. So what is a JITAI? A JITAI is an adaptive intervention design concept that aims to provide just the right amount of support at just the right time based on an individual's changing state, their internal state, perhaps uh, their mood, their psychological state, their glucose level, and their external state. Where are they? Are they at work or school? Are they walking, sitting? Um, is it uh, Monday or Saturday? And, um, uh, you know, uh, you can think of it sort of as a Goldilocks intervention. Instead of... Uh, 
uh, providing one thing. It provides uh, uh, something from a menu of options uh, at just the right time. And so you can see a few authors uh, in the lower left here uh, that have written extensively on this. But the basic structure of a jitai is that one has a decision point, uh, and this decision point may be repeated uh, across days and weeks. Uh, and at those decision points, one uses tailoring variables, those internal and external state clues, uh, to decide which intervention to select at that moment in time. And that intervention might, in a digital application, take the form of, for instance, a, um, a text message or a push notification on the mobile phone, okay? Uh, I've seen others where, um, uh, you know, they involved a physical object, like a water bottle that lit up at, at a certain moment in time that was connected to the cloud. Um, and then one measures uh, both proximal and distal outcomes. So in the example of uh, physical activity, for instance, one might measure um, steps taken in a very short amount of time after a message. Uh, and uh, the distal outcome might be the overall steps taken in a month during the entire intervention. So that's the structure. So uh, I'll give you one example. So uh, this example um, is uh, based on an mHealth application that was a JITAI called uh, OnTrack. And uh, in uh, uh, this intervention, uh, the authors opted um, to define five times a day that they might nudge an individual uh, with a message. And uh, there was an intervention component, so the, it was the actual um, uh, activity uh, um, uh, suggestion. Uh, the options for the messaging were either an active message to get up and walk a long distance, an anti-sedentary message, which was just perhaps to get up and walk across the room to get a glass of water, just get out of your chair, uh, or no suggestion at all, which one could consider the control condition. Um, and then, um, you know, there was a distal outcome, which was the total steps taken across the study, and the proximal outcome, which was the number of steps taken within 30 minutes after the message was delivered. Um, and then uh, you can see that uh, uh, the various uh, messages or arms of the JITAI uh, were delivered in a random way, uh, approximately uh, uh, 0.3 or 0.4 odds of receiving any of the message messages at a given time. And so in a trial context, you know, you might pre-plan this and you might say we're going to randomize and uh, we're going to give each of the arms an equal opportunity uh, to uh, be heard by the uh, person with diabetes or, or the person with a chronic disease. But uh, once you have uh, some understanding of how these work, then uh, understand that there are two places where one can insert machine learning into a JITAI. The first is that you can insert machine learning to understand or predict the right context in which to deliver the message. What, at what moment of the day should I choose? When is it most likely that this individual will take positive action toward their health in response to one of my nudges? The second opportunity is at this, is at this point of randomization, where you might have different messages based on uh, different uh, uh, psychological strategies, even based on different psychological theories. And from a library of those messages, a JITAI with machine learning, specifically reinforcement learning, might be able to, um, in iterations, learn from a single individual uh, which type of strategy, which type of message works best for this person. So two places where one could use machine learning. So how does one uh, then deliver this into uh, digital therapeutic to drive outcomes? Well, in diabetes, you know, I think we start with the pillars of diabetes self-management. And I think in, in various uh, nations and different consensus statements, these are probably expressed in different ways. But um, one uh, way in the U.S., uh, in the um, uh, Academy of Diabetes Educators, now called the ADCES, uh, Diabetes care and education specialists, uh, we talk about seven pillars of diabetes self-management. And those pillars are healthy eating, being physically active, monitoring your glucose, 
taking medication or, or dosing insulin uh, in the appropriate ways, um, problem solving, uh, developing problem solving skills, coping in a healthy way, and then avoiding risk taking behaviors and reducing your overall risk. So these become um, potential targets for intervention in a JATI, I think. And, and then, you know, it's very important that one not just jump into uh, saying, okay, I think I know as the healthcare provider, how shall I uh, try to nudge behavior? Really, uh, we should be talking to our colleagues in, in psychology and the behavioral sciences, and we should be asking for nudging behavior related to glucose monitoring or nudging behavior related to insulin dosing. Are there studies in the literature that are based on specific psychological theories and that use specific strategies based on those theories that have shown evidence for efficacy. And it doesn't have to be in the context of a JITAI, and it doesn't have to be in the context of a digital health intervention. But if there is evidence for that, that's where you, one wants to start. That's where you want to bake these elements into your uh, JITAI intervention. Um, so you can see examples here, um, you know, um, uh, for an individual, a theory might be the health beliefs model, and the focus of messaging might be the individual's uh, perception of the threat of a health problem and the appraisal of a recommended behavior for preventing or managing the problem. Some people may be motivated by that. A lot of teenagers I know are not, so we might have to choose a different theory. Um, and then one has to ask, what data are available to inform a uh, JITAI? And, uh, you know, we have many kinds of data. We have many kinds of data on the GLUCO platform. We have many kinds of data in our electronic health records. Uh, if we're collecting electronic um, intake forms or surveys at the point of clinical care, we have many kinds of data. So, you know, uh, glycemic variables, uh, variables related to vital signs like blood pressure, um, understanding moments in time when the individual is eating, uh, so, uh, you know, some physical uh, wearable devices can actually detect meal moments. Um, changes in patient reported outcomes measures over time. Um, uh, user engagement with an application. So if uh, the user is engaging with a uh, digital therapeutic and you record their moments of engagement, then you can actually use uh, uh, those data points to drive a, a JITAI. Um, anything related to uh, physical activity and sleep. Um, time zone changes can indicate, of course, travel. Um, uh, one can understand um, perhaps changes in uh, mood over time, changes in weather, changes in geolocation could be relevant. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things one needs to do is, uh, when building one of these, to evaluate not only what is effective, but what is palatable to the individual or the population of individuals. It may be that in some contexts, collecting geolocation uh, is very palatable, and it may be in other contexts uh, and with other populations that it's very uh, much not. Um, so uh, just to keep all those in mind, but we're surrounded by data and data that we don't use. So what are the steps to building a just-in-time adaptive intervention? It's really a three-step process. Uh, first one has to be able to capture data, uh, capturing data from um, sensors, smart devices, uh, surveys, from the medical record. Um, and for diabetes, of course, one might especially want to be able to capture, capture glucose, and one might want to be able to incorporate the passive capture of continuous glucose data. Um, and then one wants to evaluate. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, JITAI doesn't have to be built with machine learning algorithms. It can begin with simple rules-based algorithms, which makes it accessible to all of us uh, to develop one. Um, and uh, uh, one might classify or predict moments of vulnerability or opportunity. As I mentioned before, that's the first place where one can apply these algorithms. And secondly, one can A-B test or A-B-C test different intervention strategies from the behavior change wheel. And then finally, um, if we want to drive it into a digital therapeutic, our main mode of communication is through alerting uh, on the application or via text messaging. Um, and then it's important to understand that uh, you want to refine the intervention over time. So 
uh, one should allow the user to rate the advice or rate the nudge. Was this useful at this time? Um, I have engaged um, uh, as a point of study uh, with a number of digital applications that try to nudge toward physical activity or nudge dietary choices, just so I could understand how they're thinking and what they're doing. And, uh, and they do, they ask, was this useful? Uh, and so I think that's a very important component for the reinforcement learning. Uh, and, and then uh, allowing um, the individual to leave smart feedback uh, to give you a deeper understanding of why they found it useful or not useful uh, can be very helpful in, in uh, the uh, reinforcement learning. So, you know, putting it together, one wants to achieve precision engagement. The holy grail is to create a continuously learning and nudging system that tailors itself to the individual um, using A-B testing and reinforcement learning. And one wants to maximize satisfaction and efficacy at the same time. So you could take the example of Max on the left, uh, who may love learning new content and loves being reminded to check his uh, blood glucose. Um, and um, uh, Max may receive more um, actionable uh, alerts and uh, um, uh, smart uh, alerts uh, on his phone. Um, he doesn't like rewards, so perhaps uh, uh, you know, sending a smart alert after physical activity to congratulate him is not something that really drives or motivates him. And then finally, uh, you know, Daniel on the right um, doesn't like to be reminded to check blood glucose, but does like to be rewarded. And so this is that uh, Goldilocks approach. This is how one can tailor the right strategy based on theory uh, to the right individual at the right time. And then uh, finally, uh, I would just say that uh, as we think about how to leverage all of the data around us to create insights, um, in the form of uh, just-in-time adaptive interventions that are very proximal to the person with diabetes. We have to assure that our management procedures, uh, as was called out earlier in the question about GDPR, um, they achieve the highest levels of privacy and accuracy at each stage, um, you know, from data collection to transfer to processing and analyzing. Uh, it's crucial to the user satisfaction rate. It's, of course, crucial to um, government policies. And then uh, you can see on the left here that uh, um, you know, one may collect data via a variety of APIs from a variety of different sources into a JITI app. And the goal is then to um, deliver something of value to the individual with diabetes. So we cannot deliver a JITI unless the data are being collected in real time. Because if you get the data on today's behavior tomorrow, it's already too late. Um, we have many devices. Uh, you all know about the diabetes self-management devices, but I encourage you to think about other types of information. You know, our mobile phones uh, have a number of sensors in them, and uh, even screen time is a variable that may be of value in predicting an outcome or, or identifying the right context for intervention. And then uh, finally, you know, we have to continue to break down silos, uh, you know, to the degree that data sources are locked in various proprietary software and we don't have open architectures that allow the person with diabetes to direct their data to the place that will serve them best or the places that will serve them best. We as clinicians and scientists cannot serve as co-innovators uh, in this field and the persons with diabetes cannot serve as co-innovators and we really need to unlock that potential. I think it's an ethical responsibility. So with that, I'll pause and I'll thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions. All right, uh, let's open up the floor to any questions. Uh, please come up to uh, any of the microphones there in the middle aisle. I guess while we're waiting, uh, Mark, you had mentioned earlier on in the talk um, that we might be moving away from uh, A1C as, um, as a metric to be predicting. And you said if we had time, you could uh, talk to that a little bit. Um, do, do you want to start there? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, with the advent and popularization of continuous glucose monitors, there are a number of uh, summary metrics that we all evaluate as... Uh, quality metrics for diabetes care, time in range, time above, time below, 
extremely above and extremely below. Uh, measures of glycemic variability. There's a new um, uh, measure, the glycemic uh, risk index, uh, which uh, uh, pays more attention to um, the risk for highs and lows uh, than time and range, which tells you that there's a problem if the time and range is low, but doesn't tell you why. Um, and, and so, you know, taking these various biomarkers all derived from CGM data, uh, it is certainly possible to predict changes in glycemic control. And while with A1C, you can really only predict a change as frequently as A1C is collected, with these measures, we could predict changes in a much smaller time frame. So, um, you know, we, we have done some work and we have developed an initial um, uh, machine learning model in my lab that will predict, for instance, declining time and range in the next 30 days. So will it drop by 5% or more? Or will it drop below 65% just as a threshold? And uh, while we haven't operationalized that, we're very optimistic that we might be able to use that as a risk biomarker to drive um, uh, risk-based care. Uh, I have a, a question concerning the, the alerts. Um, it's very interesting to, to have this in mind. Uh, did you modelize the, uh, the number of alerts uh, uh, for, for the number of clinicians uh, in order to make this uh, reasonable? And what is the meaningful of the alerts? Have you modelized the, the alerts that need to be taken into consideration versus the others? Yeah, so to be clear, um, I, I have not implemented this in clinical practice, right? This is a thought experiment today, but all of those things should be done. So um, alerts to the person with diabetes um, should be delivered with a frequency uh, and a timing that is palatable, right? So I wouldn't want to deliver an alert to somebody at two o'clock in the morning. Well unless I was in Barcelona, because maybe people are just finishing dinner at that time. But, uh, um, but uh, uh, you know, uh, we must understand. And, and really, the structure of a JITAI allows you to learn that. So um, the JITAI can learn not just uh, what message to deliver, but also the frequency of the messages, the timing uh, of the messages, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps the tone of voice of the messages uh, could be learned. And uh, if one is alerting providers, I think that's a completely you know, different um, uh, problem uh, because uh, as you know, I'm sure, uh, with ATOPS, it, it, it is overwhelming to think about how to provide virtual care and how to handle people who are having problems out in their daily lives in between the clinical encounters. In, in the U.S., in our clinics, we have somebody on call 24-7 for these families, and they do call, and they often call Friday at midnight, right? <laughs> so, so um, you know, understanding how we can get in front of these problems but not burden the clinician with uh, so many alerts that it just creates alert fatigue and we ignore them, um, that's also, uh, I, I think, key. And we have to think about how to start with the very highest risk individuals, and then maybe slowly expand from there so that we don't overwhelm ourselves. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Um, something I'm uh, uh, curious about, I know with uh, clinical trials, we often have the problem of uh, participants' uh, adherence uh, to the protocols, especially in the home setting. Um, do you see any use of, uh, you know, with the tools that, that you presented today, how that might be able to help? Yeah, in, in recent years, especially with the pandemic, this has accelerated greatly, just like virtual remote care has accelerated. Um, decentralized clinical trials uh, have become of great interest because many trials had to suddenly stop um, and, and there were many deviations from the important, you know, scientific procedures of the trial. Uh, so understanding how a trial can be conducted in a more remote setting uh, is important for our current day and age. And in that setting, it's also important to understand how one can nudge the person with a chronic disease to 
um, adhere or engage with the trial procedures in the home setting. Uh, so I think it's very analogous and very similar to driving clinical care. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, biopharma companies are going to be very interested in these capabilities as much as we clinicians are. Sorry to hog, hog the questions, and David Kerr, Santa Barbara. Mark, I really enjoyed that. I have a philosophical question for you. Ajita is ethical. How much consent does the person with diabetes have to provide in order for this to be something that is the right thing to do? Yeah, so, you know, that's a great question. And I would say 100% consent. <laughs> so, so we can't impose this on individuals, right? Just like I can't impose a CGM device, even though I think it may be the best choice for most individuals with diabetes, just like I can't impose an insulin pump, um, there has to be shared decision making. And you also don't introduce somebody to a behavioral intervention, whether it's a JITI or a series of cognitive behavioral therapy sessions or any other behavioral intervention um, without a plan for how and when to turn it off, right? So, so it has a lifespan and the individual should understand what they're consenting to, what the story arc of the intervention is, right? What to expect each day, each week, each month, and when it will end. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that uh, that shared decision making is as important with uh, behavioral interventions and digital interventions as it is with anything else. Yeah, good answer. Um, does anybody else have any final questions? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, one final question um, and I'll actually pose it to, to both of the speakers here. So, you know, we, the, with the first talk, uh, Professor Tivale, uh, walked us through re remote care, um, and in our second talk, we we're kind of thinking about the future uh, JITI uh, ML models. Um, I'd love to get your opinion on how these two modalities might work in, in concert, or if you think that they can or should. It's a good question. Do you want? <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I, I guess I would say that I see digital therapeutics and JITI as a way to extend the reach of the clinical care team. You know, um, some ethicists and um, uh, some science writers have hypothesized that, you know, perhaps uh, the end of the clinician's expertise is in sight because soon AI will be able to diagnose and treat everybody. And I don't think that's true. I don't think AI exists in the real world outside of the walls of some, you know, very elite institutions. Um, I think that all we have is fancy math that can help us to uh, classify problems or predict problems. And then a human still has to act on it. And I think that just like my... Um, uh, iPhone reminded me today uh, that my uh, talk was at a particular time, so I didn't show up late. We can all use a little extra help from digital tools. We're, after all, living in the information age, and we're overwhelmed by information and not knowing how to harness it all. Well, this is a very nice answer, and uh, I don't have so much uh, to, to tell uh, uh, after that. But I will just underline the need to have this uh, complementary approach. And uh, uh, humans are uh, still the best to deal with the human factors. Exactly. <laughs> just, a, just a quick question. Uh, do you think that these GTIs can be uh, have, can have more adherence or are being have more use if you reward the person with uh, I say if like, actions like, like are an, followed like by an some rewards is, is that something mm -hmm. that makes sense in your plan yeah so so I actually think that one can incorporate um, incentives so uh, I, I think the um, the questioner is asking about economic incentives but maybe you know there are also non-economic incentives right so I have several teenagers. My teenagers might be very excited if they got a new TikTok video or a meme that made them laugh, right? That would be an incentive if they unlocked something. Or maybe, maybe they unlocked a short uh, hello from a, 
um, you know, a, a member of a major sports team. Um, there can be economic incentives or non-economic incentives, and I think they, they can serve as standalone interventions uh, themselves. So we actually are running in my lab um, an economic um, intervention to pay adolescents to take their mealtime insulin if there is evidence that they are missing many mealtime doses, right? So this is possible, and this has been done, again, in the weight loss, the physical activity promotion field, et cetera, a lot. Um, some of them get very creative. So there are positive incentives. You pay for performance. There are loss aversion incentives, where uh, there's some evidence that says you get a 50% boost uh, in engagement if you give them the entire um, stack of cash, so to speak, up front, you know, show them everything they're winning, um, at least let them see it, and then you take it away as they don't perform. Uh, there, in, in the U.S., we had an interesting phenomenon during the COVID pandemic where some states uh, created what uh, is called a regret lottery, uh, and they were very big lotteries, sometimes $100,000, sometimes, you know, uh, more than that. Uh, where they would uh, essentially run a lottery, draw a name from a hat, and they would announce on the news in the state, they would say, this individual won because they've been vaccinated for COVID. This individual, we drew their name, but they're not vaccinated, so they couldn't win, right? So that's maybe a little controversial example, but if you think about how to operationalize that in a smaller way, perhaps we could have a regret lottery for adolescents who are not being physically active or, you know, are checking their glucose. And maybe it's a small sum of uh, money or, or small incentive that they win um, and they can see that their peers are winning or not winning based on what they do. So there are lots of different types of incentives. I'm not an expert in uh, uh, behavioral economic incentives, but again, I am a student of them. And it's easy to imagine how to incorporate them into a jatai as well. Looks like we might have another question. Thanks, Peter. Netherlands. Um, we talk about incentives. The end game will be perhaps an annual visit and a lot of remote contacts. How will the payers adapt to it? without hospitals getting bankrupt and not getting the money. The end game will be cheaper, cost effective, yeah. but how do we make the transition with the payers? So there, you know, there, there does have to be work up front. I wouldn't even be up here talking to you uh, and asking questions about remote care um, you know, during uh, Professor Tivoli's presentation if the U.S. didn't already have our government uh, providing a new payment model for delivering remote patient monitoring, right? So now healthcare providers can be paid um, for enrolling the patient in a data sharing program. Um, for the first monthly contact, in person, virtual, telephonic, and the second monthly contact, 20 minutes each, right? Uh, and, and these are new reimbursement codes in our fee for service model. Now, how does a value-based care delivery program do that? Uh, I, I don't know, uh, but I would imagine you have to show that you can achieve quality outcomes, and then you get paid for those quality outcomes. How does a national health care payer um, uh, program do it? I, I don't know, but uh, clearly in France, you know, they're, they're trying something. So, so I think that uh, it is important, and it speaks to the importance of advocacy um, because uh, there, there are many levers, you know, acting on whether nations and governments are working toward both uh, remote care solutions um, and toward uh, digital health solutions, right? So I know, for instance, in Germany, right, there's reimbursement for digital health applications. Probably there are in some other nations of Europe as well. Uh, and, and so as nations begin to experiment, we need to study what's being successful in each nation. Okay. Um, can we give uh, Dr. Clements another round of applause? Thank you. Uh, so that uh, concludes our uh, session today. Uh, thank you for your attendance. And uh, thank you uh, both uh, for speaking. Thanks, Dave.